All right, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. We're gonna be doing MSK and Ortho today, practice questions um, from Pants Prep Pearls as well as from the Pants Blueprint. So I created all the topics in a form of a question, just the high yield points for each question. And we'll kind of go through those. I'll give you a second to formulate the association and um, we'll go through each topic so you get all, the, get all the main points. So first, we'll start with what are the six Ps of compartment syndrome? So what are the six Ps of compartment syndrome? What is the delta pressure? What is the delta pressure? How do we diagnose this condition? What is the treatment of this condition? And what is the earliest finding of this condition? So it's important to know the earliest finding as well of this condition. So the six Ps, that's gonna be pain out of proportion to the physical exam, pallor, pulselessness, poikilothermia, so a cold limb, paralysis, and also paresthesias, paresthesias. And the delta pressure, so the delta pressure is important. It's one of the things we can help to figure out um, the diagnosis. It's gonna be the diastolic venous pressure minus the compartmental pressure. So if the compartmental pressure goes over the diastolic blood pressure that we need the veins to pump back up, um, back to the inferior vena cava, then we're not gonna be able to get any blood out and the compartment's gonna bulge. So this is diagnosed by pressure measurements of the capsule itself. So you can actually stick something in there and it will measure the pressure. And if we're over 30, that's gonna be, that's gonna be diagnostic. And the treatment, of course, is a fasciotomy that we need to do to relieve the pressure in there. The earliest finding, sometimes they'll ask what is the earliest finding, not just what are the findings. The earliest finding is pain with passive stretching of the limb. So pain with passive stretching. And the latest finding, that's gonna be paresthesias of the limb. All right, so what bug, what bacteria is associated with prosthetic joint replacements? What bug is associated with prosthetic joint replacements? What's the mode of spread in children versus adults of an infected joint? What is a sequestrum versus an involucrum? That's an important one, sequestrum versus involucrum. And what is the most common cause overall of this condition? So most common bug with joint replacements, children versus adults, sequestrum versus inv involucrum, and most common cause overall. So for um, prosthetic joint replacements, that's gonna be staph epidermidis, staph epidermidis. And we also remember staph epidermidis from subacute bacterial endocarditis. So staph epidermidis for those joint replacements. And for children compared to adults, children are gonna be a more hematogenous spread, where adults is more common direct inoculation, like a pressure injury, um, a pressure ulcer for, for the elderly or other trauma directly into that, um, into that area. So children, hemato hematogenous spread in adults, direct inoculation, pressure injury, or trauma. So a sequestrum is the segments of necrotic bone that are separated from the normal bone, whereas the involucrum is that what surrounds it. So it's basically like an artificial periosteum. The involucrum is that surrounds that sequestrum or that sequestered area of necrotic bone. And the most common cause overall, that's gonna be staph aureus. Acute osteomyelitis associated with sickle cell disease makes you think of what and what is the treatment for that? So sickle cell and osteomyelitis and treatment. Also, a patient comes in with a puncture wound in the shoe. What bacteria are you concerned for at that point and what is the treatment for that condition? And what is the most common bug in neonates? And what is the treatment for that condition? So a few different ones. Sickle cell, osteomyelitis, puncture wound from a shoe, osteomyelitis, and most common bug for osteomyelitis in neonates and the treatment for all these. So sickle cell, that's gonna be salmonella. So that's a very important one, salmonella with sickle cell. And you wanna do a third gen, like ceftriaxone um, or ciprofloxacin, a fluoroquinolone to cover gram negatives. Pseudomonas, if they have a puncture wound in the shoe, you want to be thinking of pseudomonas, and you want to use a fourth gen, like cefepime. Um, GBS is most common in neonates, and you want to use cefotaxime plus vanc. So GBS is gram positive, so you can use vanc for that, as well as cefotaxime as well. What condition is on the weight-bearing joints? When does this condition hurt? And what do we see on the fingers? So that's going to be, and also what are the three must-know signs on radiograph of this condition? So that's going to be, of course, osteoarthritis, 
Osteoarthritis is worse dur- uh, throughout the day or after activities through the day as opposed to RA. RA is worse in the morning, um, remember, and gets better throughout the day. So in OA, we have Heberden's and Bouchard's nodes. So remember, Heberden's nodes, those are the DIP, and Bouchard's nodes, those are a little bit closer, those are at the PIP. And the three important um, things what we can see on radiograph for osteoarthritis are subchondral bone sclerosis, osteophytes, as well as asymmetric joint space narrowing. So important, subchondral bone sclerosis, osteophytes, and asymmetric, because it's those weight-bearing joints, so somebody's posture or gait might be affected asymmetrically as opposed to RA, which is typically symmetric. So OA, asymmetric joint space narrowing. What is the treatment for MSSA, methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, or methicillin-resistant staph aureus? So MRSA versus MSSA. So MSSA is going to be nafcillin, oxacillin, or cefazolin. Nafcillin, oxacillin, or cefazolin. And for MRSA, vanc, vancomycin, clinda, linazolid. And also we can think of orally doxycycline, um, Bactrim as well. So what form... What forms between the joints in long-term RA? So what forms between the joints in long-term RA, rheumatoid arthritis? Describe a joint that has RA as opposed to OA. And what is RA spare? What is spared in RA? Important to know it forms a panis. So it forms a panis between the joints, basically destroys the joints and forms an inflammatory area, a panis, and it can even basically mold the joints together after a lot of destruction. So for a joint RA, it's going to be symmetric, as we said, boggy, erythematous, and also ulnar deviation in the long term. So once the panis is forming, you'll tend to see the fingers basically ulnarly deviating because of the destruction between the joints there. And also the DIPs, the distal interphalangeal joints are not affected in RA, where they are in uh, OA. And that's the Heberden's nodes on the DIP. Okay, what's the first line agent for RA? When is it worse? And when does it get better? And what is Kaplan's syndrome? So first line agent for RA, when is it worse? When is it better? And what is Kaplan's syndrome? <clears throat> so we want to use a DMARD, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug, and that's going to be methotrexate first line for RA. We can do NSAIDs and also leflunamide too, but methotrexate is going to be your go-to for RA. And RA is worse in the morning, but it gets better with action throughout the day. So it takes them a little bit to get warmed up in RA, and they get better throughout the day. Again, as the opposite from OA. OA is worse at the end of the day after you, use, after you have used the joints for a while. And Kaplan syndrome, a good one to know, is a triad. It's rheumatoid arthritis, pneumoconiosis, and also pulmonary nodules. So pulmonary, no, pulmonary nodules, rheumatoid arthritis, and pneumoconiosis for Kaplan syndrome. Okay, so what's the first, a lot of things to do with RA here. What's the first test we get in RA? What's the most specific test to get in RA for lab findings? And what do we want to get before any surgery? So these are three good ones. The first test we want to get is an RF, rheumatic factor. So rheumatic factor is the first test we get. It's not the most specific, however. The most specific is an anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide. I believe that stands for anti-CCP. So anti-CCP is the most specific in RA. And also, we need to know that there's atlantoaxial instability with RA. So before the anesthesia is going to want a cervical x-ray before any surgery to make sure that they're not going to basically break their vertebrae if they're intubating them or if anything were to happen. So instability at C1 and C2 with RA is important to know as well. And just a couple side effects here for some of the drugs. So hydroxychloroquine, that's also another drug we can use, not first line for RA. What is the side effect for hydroxychloroquine? And what is the side effect for methotrexate? Just a couple of the major ones that we should know. So for hydroxychloroquine, the major side effect is going to be retinal toxicity. So they have to get annual eye exams, it says, for hydroxychloroquine. So retinal toxicity for hydroxychloroquine. And for methotrexate, bone marrow suppression and also liver and lung. So bone marrow suppression and liver and lung for methotrexate. And what are the significant side effects of corticosteroid therapy? So some of these patients might be on long-term, long-term corticosteroids. What kind of side effects would we expect them to see? So they might have hyperglycemia, glucose is increased, weight gain, 
edema, immunosuppression from long-term long corticosteroid use, and osteoporosis as well. Okay, what is the most common septic joint? What is the most common bug overall for septic joints? And white blood cell count on arthrocentesis will be what? Once you aspirate it, what will you see um, on arthrocentesis of a septic joint? If it's a young male who's sexually active, what, what will you see? And what population is the sternoclavicular joint involved in? If they're having a septic sternoclavicular joint, so that's a good one. So the most common septic joint overall is gonna be knee. <clears throat> so knee is the most common overall. The most common bug overall, most common bacteria is gonna be Staph aureus. The white blood cell count on arthrocentesis for a septic joint, that should be over 50K. So over 50K you wanna be thinking with white blood cells, uh, septic joint. And a young male, you want to be thinking gonorrhea, disseminated gonorrhea. So how I remember that is RTA for gonorrhea. This is rash. They can have a rash in gonorrhea, tenosynovitis, and arthralgias. So RTA for disseminated gonorrhea. And you want to be thinking about that if there's a young male sexually active in the vignette. And interestingly, for sternoclavicular joint, um, septic uh, arthritis, septic joint, you can, it's IV drug users that's predisposed to that. So IV drug users for sternoclavicular joint. Okay, next, for developmental dysplasia of the hip, DDH, explain the Barlow and Ortolani maneuvers. That's a really important one. Barlow and Ortolani maneuvers. What are the risk factors for DDH? So there's a few notable risk factors. How do we diagnose it if they're under six months old? Or how do we diagnose it if they're over six months old? Important. What is the best test for each of those ages? What's the treatment for this? And also, what's the Galeazzi sign? More of a sign than a test. What's the Galeazzi sign? Okay, so for the Barlow maneuver, you're taking your hands, you're putting them on the infant's knees, and you're adducting and pushing down. So you're pushing down, you're pushing low, and you're taking a reduced hip and attempting to dislocate it. So you're trying to see if there's any instability in that hip with the Barlow. For the Ortolani, is out. So you're taking the hips that are already adducted, and you're moving them out, and you're trying to, um, trying to, Put the hip, you're trying to reduce the hip basically if it's already out. So that's what your finger is going to be doing in that case. So Ortolani out, bar low, you adduct the hips and push low. That's how I remember it. Um, so risk factors for DDH, importantly, that's going to be breach. If the patient was, well, if the baby was breech, if they're female, that weight increases the risk, and also if they're firstborn. So breach, female, and firstborn for DDH risk factors. If they're under six months, you want to do an ultrasound first line, maybe because that cartilage isn't fully developed. And over six months, or the bone's not fully developed, so we can't even really see it on an x-ray. But if they're over six months, years of age, then we want to do an x-ray. So under six months, ultrasound, over six months, x-ray. And treatment is, of course, that pavlic harness that allows their hips to set in there pretty good. Pavlic harness. And the Galeazzi test is when they're lying on their back and you they have their knees flexed and their hips a little bit flexed and their feet are flat, you can see if there's any um, disruption in the height comparison between both knees. So to see if their hips a little bit off. Okay, so you observe the knee height, supine and flat. Okay, so that was a Galeazzi. How about a high impact injury and the patient has perineal ecchymosis? So what are you thinking if they have a high impact injury like an MVA and they have perineal ecchymosis? So you wanna be thinking pelvic fracture and the perineal ecchymosis, that's also called Fox sign. So how do we differentiate a hip fracture from a hip dislocation? So differentiating from a hip fracture from dislocation is very important based on what they tell you in the vignette. What's the most common type of these? And what is the most common mechanism? And what are two important complications to know? Okay, so a fracture, they'll tell you the patient has an external rotate, externally rotated and abducted and shortened hip. So externally rotated, abducted, and shortened hip for fracture, whereas dislocation is going to be an adducted and shortened and internally rotated hip. So adducted, shortened, and internally rotated for dislocation. So you think if basically like in a dashboard trauma or something, the dashboard pushes the hip back while the patient's seated, so obviously that's going to posteriorly dislocate them. And in that case, the adductor is going to pull that, pull that leg in, and it's going to also be internally rotated as well. So MVA, 
like we said, or high impact, and posterior is the most common for hip. So posterior is the most common for hip, as well as the most common for elbow dislocation. And two most common complications are sciatic nerve injury, of course, because it runs right down the back there, and avascular necrosis. What are the three locations for hip fracture? Which has the highest rate of avascular necrosis? So, of course, femoral neck, which is the highest risk of avascular necrosis, intertrochanteric, and also subtrochanteric. Okay, so what do you think if there's a young boy coming in? He has family that smoke in the house. He's five years old, ages four to 10. He's obese and he has leg pain and limping. So important to know the age, five to four to 10 here. That's gonna be leg calf perth disease. So very important. What will you see on physical exam of leg calf perth disease? What is this also known as? It's most common in who? And how many times more common than the other people? That's gonna be loss of abduction and internal rotation on physical exam. Loss of abduction and internal rotation. It's also known as avascular necrosis of the femoral head. It's more common in males by a lot, so four to one times more common in males than females as well. And it's important to know, you can even like, you're gonna know if it's LCPD versus Skiffy, just based on the age almost. So if they give you like a 12 year old person, a 12 year old boy, it's probably not gonna be LCPD, but if they give you also a five year old boy, it's probably not gonna be Skiffy. So you can almost just tell by the age but sometimes they won't give you that and they'll just give you the lack of abduction internal rotation or something else or radiograph finding. <clears throat> so how about, we just gave it away, child that's 10 to 16 years old, they're obese, they're African American, they had a growth spurt recently, importantly, and they have a painful limp with knee pain. So this is Skiffy, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. What are the major risk factors for this condition? What will physical exam show for this condition? And how about the radiographs for this condition? So what are the risk factors for Skiffy, physical exam, and radiographs? So very important to know, hypothyroidism, diabetes mellitus, and hypopituitarism. So endocrine disorders are really gonna predispose you to this um, Skiffy, as well as going through a growth spurt at the time for, for young boys. Um, externally rotated leg, and also the classic radiograph finding is an ice cream slipping off the cone. So that femoral head will just be slipping off the neck. So you can see it like an ice cream slipping off the cone on radiograph. <clears throat> okay, what is a popliteal cyst? What is a popliteal cyst? What is it also called? That's gonna be Baker's cyst, an outpouching of synovial fluid. So that's a popliteal cyst. It's on the back of the knee. Most common knee injury. What is the most common knee injury overall of all knee injuries? That's gonna be a medial collateral ligament injury. And explain varus and valgus stress tests. ACL tear, how does it happen? And what do we see on physical exam? So varus versus valgus stress tests, ACL tear, and how does it happen? There's a few things to know for that. And what do we see on physical exam? So um, varus and valgus stress tests, you want to do this with 30 degrees of flexion to isolate both the MCL and the LCL, depending on which way you're going. And you want to apply a um, outside force, a lateral force, if you're testing a valgus stress of the knee to make sure that MCL is intact. And varus, if you're applying medial force in the knee, you're testing the LCL, and that's a varus stress test. And you want to do it, like I said, at 30 degrees of flexion to take out, because if you do it at full extension, you're using other structures to stabilize that knee and give it ligamentous stability. So doing it at 30 degrees is the proper way to do it. So for ACL tear, how does it happen? Typically non-contact, they're going to give you a vignette of them having non-contact or sometimes contact, pivoting injury with deceleration, hyperextension, and internal rotation potentially of the knee. And on physical exam, very important in pathognomonic for ACL tear is swelling, hemarthrosis, and knee buckling. So definitely that hemarthrosis. <clears throat> okay, what's the best test for the ACL tear? What's the second best test for the ACL tear on physical exam? And also explain these tests. 
and what is the pivot shift test. So a few tests we need to know here for ACL tear. So the best test is going to be Lachman's test, and that's when you're at about 15 to 20 degrees of flexion, and you're basically doing an anterior jaw, but at that point. So you can put you can put some stability onto the foot while you try to basically pull the ACL. And if you have a soft endpoint, that would maybe indicate an ACL tear. Whereas if you had a nice hard endpoint and it stopped really abruptly when you were trying to pull um, forward in the tibia, then that would indicate maybe the ACL is intact. And the second best test, that's going to be the anterior draw test. Basically the same thing, except they're lying supine. They have knee fully flexed. You can sit on the foot and you can pull forward as well. But that's not as good as the Lachman test, which is the number one test. And also, what is a pivot shift test? So the pivot shift test, um, it's also very good, but hard to do in patients that are awake because they naturally will flex some of their muscles to tense up. But you're going to be maintaining internal rotation. You'll apply a valgus force to the knee while it's slowly flexed. And it'll be positive if the tibia location on the femur is reduced as the distal IT band pulls it back into the blade. So remember, the IT band is connected to the um, lateral tibia, so that's going to reduce it back into place because that still has tension um, if we have an, a non-intact ACL. What fracture is associated with ACL tear? When do we do surgery, typically, on an ACL tear? And what is also the unhappy O'Donohue triad? So what is the fracture associated with ACL tear? When do we do surgery? And what's the unhappy O'Donohue triad? So that's going to be a Sagan fracture. So Sagan fracture is an avulsion of the lateral tibial condyle that's associated or pathognomonic for ACL tear. And also, we're going to do surgery on patients with significant knee instability in an active person or an athlete that's under 40. So if they're older and they have some stability left, we're probably not going to do surgery on them. So under 40, athlete, um, very unstable, then we can do surgery for the ACL. And the unhappy O'Donohue triad is ACL plus MCL plus a medial meniscus tear. So ACL, MCL, medial meniscus tear for unhappy O'Donohue triad. <clears throat> okay, patient in an accident and the tibia is displaced posteriorly. What is the likely injury? What physical exam maneuver should we do? So that's going to be a PCL rupture, posterior crucial ligament rupture, and the posterior draw is the test for this ligament. How about a patient feels a slight popping after squatting and twisting his knee with the weight on his back after it swelled up, but it didn't swell up the day of, it swelled up the day after, what's the likely diagnosis? And what's the most common area for this pathology to occur? And what's the best physical exam for this? I don't have the answer. So that's going to be a meniscus tear because you're typically twisting, you're feeling a, it's catching, and it typically doesn't swell. It might swell up the day of, but in the vignette, sometimes they give you two to three days, they came back, and now it's starting to swell up and cause them pain, and it's really getting caught up in there. And you want to do the McMurray's test for this. So what is the sunrise view? What is the sunrise view? This is the patella, when you look at it on a front, front view, patella on the condyles, looking for patella fracture or pathology such as narrowing between the condyles and the, fib, and the um, patella as well. So sunrise view, we'll look for patella fracture or pathology. So a young male comes to the office, 10 to 15 years old. He has pain on each proximal tibia after repeated sports. What's the diagnosis? And explain the pathology for this condition as well. So what's the diagnosis of that and the pathology? So, so that's osgood Schlatter's disease. And this is the repeated force exerted across the patella tendon as it inserts into the tibial tuberosity. It's an apophysitis after all. The growth plate, you want to do rest in ice and um, swelling and pain occurs during the growth spurts as well. So they're just repeated pulling on that leads to swelling of that area and they just need to rest a little bit and it'll be fine. And it's usually symmetrical as well. What is patella baja and what does it mean? And what is patella alta? <clears throat> what is patella baja and what is patella alta? So patella baja is patella below, and that will be a quad tendon rupture because if we rupture the ligament above the tendon rather above, 
then it's just going to pull everything down because there's nothing pulling it up. And alta is above, so this is a patella tendon rupture. If the patella tendon rupture is below and the quad contracts, that's going to pull up the patella. What physical exam maneuver can these patients not do? And what is the risk factor? What are the risk factors? So these patients with this rupture, they can't extend the knee at all because they've lost that mechanism. It's typically a male over 40 and in those who have systemic disease. So they're diabetics, gout, obesity, etc. maybe fluoroquinolone use. And how does a patella dislocate? So how does a patella dislocate? In whom is this dislocation most common? So like where does it dislocate? Which side basically? What should we do on physical exam? And what is the management of this? So it dislocates with a valgus force twisting. So you're pushing from the outside of the knee in, the knee bows in medially, and the patella pops out. Or you could have a, just a direct blow to the patella itself. And lateral is more common, and it's also more common in females. And we should do the apprehension test, where the patient will contract the quads when we push laterally, laterally on the patella, and they show apprehension with that, they show their pain. And it's only done if the patella is reduced already. We're obviously not going to do this if the patella is... Um, still subluxed. So the management is conservative to start, brace, ice, knee immobilization, and also post-reduction films. And also we want to strengthen the quadriceps muscles to kind of keep that, keep that patella in its groove. What artery is potentially injured in a tibiofemoral dislocation? So what artery is typically injured in a tibiofemoral dislocation, so a knee dislocation? What nerve is injured? And what test must we immediately do and never miss? Okay, so popliteal artery, that's going to be the popliteal artery. The peroneal nerve, the common peroneal nerve. And also arteriography or ultrasound to rule out artery injury is always needing to be done. What is foot drop and what nerve is injured? So what is foot drop and what nerve is injured? So that's just basically when you can't dorsiflex the foot. And that's going to be the common peroneal nerve. You may also have trouble everting the foot as well. So a young female cyclist, a young female cyclist, she's very active. She has pain when ascending and descending stairs. She is a very avid cyclist. Pain when ascending and descending stairs. What is their diagnosis? So where might they feel pain on the physical exam, if you know the diagnosis? And what muscle do we want to strengthen to help this condition. So what muscle do we want to strengthen? Where are we going to find the pain? And what is this in the first place? So this is patellofemoral syndrome or chondromalacia patellae. This is also anterior knee pain behind or around the patella on physical exam. So potentially a positive patella apprehension test. And we want to strength this, strengthen the vastus medialis obliquus. So the vastus medialis, the quads, especially the medial side, which will help. So a cyclist comes and they have pain in their lateral knee below the tibial lateral condyle. What is it? So pain in their lateral knee below the lateral tibial condyle. What is it? What two tests can we do for this? And how does this condition arise? So, and they're a very avid cyclist and they use that knee a lot. So this is going to be iliotibial band syndrome, ITB syndrome. We can do the over test for this. So how I remember this is you put one leg over the other, over, over. It's adduction of one leg over the other, which leads to pain. And this also helps stretch the TFL to see if that's involved too, the tensor fascia lata, which connects to the IT band as it courses down laterally. So we can also do the noble test. So this is pain on palpation of the IT band at 30 degrees of flexion. So it takes a noble patient to take the pain, kind of like an apprehension test. So it's pain on palpation of that IT band at 30 degrees of flexion. That's when we kind of stretch the IT band quite a bit. And the pathology, how does this condition arise? It arises due to excess friction from the changes in direction and increased activity, as well as a tight IT band. Pain will result from contraction of the IT band with femoral condyle. We might see edema on the MRI. So over the femoral condyle, it keeps on hitting that with each cycle that they take. So we can see some edema, inflammation of that. It can cause pain.
So what is the most common ligament injured in an ankle sprain? Most common ligament injured in ankle sprain. What's the most common mechanism for this ligament to be injured? What about if it's injured medially, then what do we think? And what are the Ottawa ankle rules? So important thing to know, the Ottawa ankle rules. Should we get the radiograph or not, basically? And so they need a, okay, so most common lig ligament injured is the ATFL anterior table, talofibular ligament. That's on the lateral side. That's the most common injured. The mechanism is typically inversion. Um, if you're inverting your foot, you're really stretching that ligament. And if it happens fast and with a lot of velocity, that can pop. And how about medially? That's going to be the deltoid ligament, the deltoid ligament of the medial ankle. And what are the ankle, Ottawa ankle rules? So the Ottawa ankle rules say you need to get a radiograph if, if at the ankle, the lateral or medial malleolus has pain on it, especially the posterior half of each lateral and medial malleolus. If at the foot, the navicular has pain or the fifth metatarsal has pain. And again, that fifth metatarsal, you want to be thinking about a Jones fracture potentially. And for both the inability to walk over four steps in the ER or at the time of injury. So four things, you want to check those things on the ankle, the foot, and inability to walk four steps at any time. What ortho condition do you think of with fluoroquinolone use? So we already alluded to this one. What ortho condition do you think of with fluoroquinolone use? And what physical exam maneuver should we do if this condition happens that is associated with fluoroquinolone use? <clears throat> what test is good for that? What's the classic presentation in a vignette of this condition? And what's the best uh, positioned to put it in for non-operative treatment? So if we want to do non-operative treatment of this condition, how do we place the foot? Okay, so that's going to be Achilles tendon rupture. What physical exam do we do? We can do the Thompson's test where they go on their belly, they put their knee flexed, and we squeeze on the calf to see if the Achilles tendon is still functioning. If the foot doesn't plant our flex with that, then it might be ruptured. The classic presentation is maybe a weekend warrior that starts to exert themselves or pushes off and hears a pop at the back of their leg and can't really walk or falls down or something like that. And the best position for non-operative conditions, that's going to be resting Aquinas. So Aquinas, the horse, is, stands for horse, so horse's tail. It's, we're trying to rest the horse's tails together because it looks like fraying at the end of each tendon. So we want to get those tendons approximated as much as we can to increase the chance of healing of uh, those tendon edges. So resting Aquinas is the best position for non-operative conditions. And we're going to need to put the foot in a little plantar flexion to do that. So what is a Weber class A, B, and C? So it's important to know for the syndesmotic injuries of the ankle, what is a Weber class, A, B, and C. So how I remember it is it goes from low to high. So A is the lowest. This is below the syndesmosis. And this is where the fibula attaches. Below the syndesmosis, and this is deltoid ligament intact. So below the syndesmosis, the deltoid, which is that medial ligament, below the medial malleolus is intact. A Weber B is going to be at the level of the syndesmosis, which will not be intact. <clears throat> and above the level of the syndesmosis is a Weber C. So this is the deltoid ligament is also torn, and this is very unstable. So C is potentially the worst. So A below, B at, C above, deltoid is torn with C, deltoid is intact with A. So if you have a ruptured, if you have a ruptured deltoid ligament or a medial malleolus fracture, what do you always want to check for? So if you have this injury, a ruptured deltoid ligament or a medial malleolus fracture, what do you want to check for? Important to know, you want to check for proximal fibular palpation, or you want to get an x-ray to rule out a Masonove fracture. A Masonove fracture, that's when you have that tearing of the distal talofibular syndesmosis, and it kind of tracks up the whole interosseous um, all the way up to the proximal fibula, which you get out of a fracture there. So it's like the force is transmitted from the syndesmosis to the interosseous, um, area all the way up between the fibula and tibia to fracture that proximal tip, uh, fracture that uh, proximal fibula there. So Masono fracture if you have that medial malleolus injury. Fracture of the distal tibia 
on the talus during a high impact incident is called what? So distal tibia on the talus, high impact. That's going to be a pylon or a tibial plafond fracture. What is the most common area for a stress fracture? So what's the most common area for a stress fracture, although there's many? What is the most important thing to know about the diagnosis of these fractures? What is the likely vignette of this condition? So it's important to know how to recognize it based on the vignette that they give you. So this is going to be the third metatarsal as the most common area. And remember, it can also happen in the tibial area, also the navicular bone, and of course the fibula too. But the third metatarsal of the foot is going to be the most common area for a stress fracture. And also it's important to know, to diagnose these fractures, that the x-ray is going to be negative in 50% or even more. So if there's a high suspicion, you must go non-weight bearing so it can actually heal or get an MRI to confirm the diagnosis. So the x-ray, is it's not as sensitive enough to pick up these minor minor uh, breaks in the bone. So you need to get an MRI and that will that will hopefully reveal it. <clears throat> and the likely vignette is somebody, again, maybe a weekend warrior, somebody who just started exercise that hasn't done it and is doing some high impact exercise, some repetitive exercise, like running a mile, training for a marathon, and they're doing some overuse. This could be an athlete, also military personnel as well. So next patient is a 50 year old male he got out of bed in the morning and felt pain at the bottom of his foot. This was, however, relieved throughout the day. What does it make you think of? What are some of the risk factors for this condition? So this is, of course, plantar fasciitis, classic presentation, got out of bed in the morning, or they might say they got out of their truck because they're a truck driver after driving for eight hours and they felt the pain at the bottom of their foot and they have no other physical um, exam findings. Risk factors for plantar fasciitis, obesity, of course, the more weight, the more you're putting on that plantar fascia. Also flat feet and heel spurs. And also remember when you're sleeping too, your feet naturally plantar flex a little bit. So you're really tightening up that plantar fascia without even noticing it. Okay, Tenille's sign is positive just under the medial malleolus. What is that? What are the symptoms of this typically? And what confirms the diagnosis? So that's a good one to know. Tenille sign is positive under the medial malleolus. <clears throat> it's going to be tarsal tunnel syndrome. Tarsal tunnel syndrome, similar to carpal tunnel syndrome, pain and numbness at the medial malleolus, the heel or the sole, worse at night, and increases throughout the day with no improvement with rest. So it's that compression of the tibial nerve there that tracks under the medial malleolus. And you want to do an EMG to confirm the diagnosis. So the flexor ret retinaculum traces over it, and that can compress it, just like in carpal tunnel, basically, as well as cubital tunnel. And EMG is a definitive diagnosis for that. So what is a bunion? So what is a bunion? Um, another name for it is hallux valgus. It's when that big toe points in, in the first, uh, first knuckle of the big toe kind of is out. So the foot's kind of looking like a, like a right angle almost. So hallux valgus is bunion. What do you have when the patient has joint damage and destruction from peripheral neuropathy? So a diabetic patient, long-term peripheral neuropathy, now has joint damage and destruction of the foot especially. What is that? So what do you see on physical exam for this as well? And what condition predisposes? I already said diabetics. That's Charcot's arthropathy. And this is from diabetes mellitus, peripheral arterial disease. It's destruction of the joint between the midfoot and the ankle results in foot deformity and destruction of the joint with a flat foot. Basically, all just caves in and gets destroyed. What is a compression neuropathy of the interdigital nerve? So compression neuropathy of the interdigital nerve of the foot. What is the classical physical exam sign that you can do? Which metatarsals are involved commonly? And what is the history going to show? So important, compression neuropathy, physical exam, one common sign that we should know, metatarsals, which ones, and what's going on in the history? What's the vignette going to say? So this is Morton's neuroma, interdigital neuroma. Mulder's sign is when you squeeze the tarsals together and also are palpating that interdigital area, you feel a clicking sensation. So that's Mulder's sign. Most commonly between the third and fourth spaces, 
tightly fitting shoes is a risk factor, high heels, flat feet, also female with a burning or lancinating pain in that foot. So remember that clicking sensation, burning, lancinating, um, tightly fitting shoes is a Morton's neuroma. Okay, so pain on the lateral side of the foot, what are you concerned for? Pain on the lateral side of the foot, what are you concerned for? What is the length of treatment for this condition, if you know what it is? What is the big complication to be aware of? And how do we differ it from pseudo something? <laughs> how do we differ it from pseudo? So this is a very important one to know. This is a Jones fracture. So this is a fracture through the fifth metatarsal at the met metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. So basically where the bone touches the other bone. Not pseudo Jones, which is just an avulsion fracture of the tuberosity of the base, base of the fifth metatarsal. So more proximally there. Non-weight bearing and a cast for six to eight weeks. So again, high risk of avascular necrosis for this just like the scaphoid fracture. Avascular necrosis, or a non-union, poor blood supply, analogous to a scaphoid fracture, just like we said. So it probably gets a blood supply, distillate approximately, or tenuous blood supply in the middle area of that uh, Jones area, which is where the fifth metatarsal touches the fourth metatarsal. <clears throat> and again, pseudo-Jones, just an avulsion fracture of that tip of the fifth metatarsal. So if you find a pseudo Jones on x-ray, a walking cast for two to three weeks is the treatment. So they might give you a radiograph. You have to see what it is. Is it an avulsion? Because you can choose a lighter treatment here. But if it's uh, a true Jones, then six to eight weeks, non-weight bearing. Patient with midfoot pain after falling off of a horse. What is the main concern? So that's another classic one. Midfoot pain. What's the classic x-ray sign? Treatment for this is how long? So how long do we need to treat the patient for this? So that's a Liz Frank injury. And we call it injury because it's a fracture and a dislocation, can be, can be fracture, fracture dislocation injury of the metatarsals and cuneiforms displaced laterally. Displaced laterally. So you'll see a large space between the big toe, basically, on radiograph and the rest of them, right after the cuneiforms. So you see the flex sign classically on x-ray. And again, fracture at the base of the second metatarsal is pathognomonic. And you want to do open reduction internal fixation and not non-weight bearing for 12 weeks. So we said Jones is six to eight weeks. Well, we need to do ORIF and non-weight bearing for 12 weeks for Liz Frank. So those are two pretty serious ones. What are the two common fractures in kids? <clears throat> what are two common fractures in kids is going to be Taurus, the buccal fracture, and also green stick fractures. Taurus and green stick. Okay, a very important one. Explain the Salter-Harris classification. So what's the Salter-Harris classification? Which has the best prognosis and which has the worst prognosis, if we can remember? And which is the most common? So we need to know most common, best and worst, and what does it actually stand for? So the mnemonic I have is this. So Salter-Harris 1 through 5, and I spell out I mean, this is a common mnemonic, S-A-L-T-R. So one, Salter-Harris one, means same. So it's just right through. Two is above, Salter-Harris two, A, above. Three, now you're looking at it with the epiphysis on the bottom. So pretend you're looking at a femur, for instance. So above would actually be in the metaphysis, as opposed to the epiphysis, which would be on the bottom in this case. So don't get confused depending on where, which way the bone is. Three, S -A -S -A -L, is lower. Four is T, through. Right through, but through vertically, not through the same, like one. So through vertically, so up and down. And five is rammed. That has the worst prognosis. So it's crushed. You could lead to um, resumption with compression of the growth plate, ephysis. So one and two of the best outcomes. Two is the most common, and five is the worst as it may um, result in resumption of growth, which is bad. What is the most common bone malignancy in young adults? Most common bone malignancy in young adults. What's the classic history that you might get with a bone malignancy? And what do we see on x-ray? So the most common is gonna be osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma. It's from 15 to 25 years old. It's most commonly in the distal femur, 
and they'll have classically night pain, night pain, and sometimes day pain as well, but night pain. And also it's important to know the classic Codman's triangle, which is for two of the different bone tumors, but Codman's triangle for osteosarcoma, hair on end appearance, and a sunburst pattern. So osteosarcoma, hair on end appearance, and a sunburst pattern, and no onion skinning for this one. So you try to remember which one is onion skinning, it's not osteosarcoma. What is onion skinning and what is a moth eaten appearance? So these ones we need to be important to differentiate. Onion skinning versus and moth-eaten appearance, that's gonna be Ewing sarcoma. So Ewing sarcoma. So this is the second most common primary bone tumor and the femur is the most common area for this to be affected as well. So Ewing sarcoma, ew, onions, gross, even though I like onions, Ewing sarcoma. Moth-eaten appearance is also classic for Ewing sarcoma as well. So on an x-ray, incidentally, you see a presumed bone mass that is pedunculated on a stalk and grows away from the growth plate. What is this? This is osteochondroma. So osteochondroma, and it's benign. And also to note, I didn't add any pictures really to this document. However, if you wanna see pictures of all of them, I added pictures to the regular MSK video. Um, that goes through every condition in full detail and gives you a picture too. So this one doesn't really have pictures. Hopefully it's meant to be more quicker, more quick, but the other one does have pictures if you want to actually see these conditions, or you can just look it up. So the patient is having bone pain that is worse at night, but when you give an NSAID, 20 minutes later, he feels better. What is the likely diagnosis? So very important. Bone pain at night, worse at night, when you give an NSAID, 20, minute, 20 minutes later, he feels better. So this is an osteoid osteoma. And remember, a prostaglandin secreting nidus. So that's what it does. It's a prostaglandin secreting nidus. And this makes sense because if he feels better right away after giving an NSAID, an NSAID is a uh, prostaglandin blocker. So if we're gonna decrease the prostaglandins, then that's gonna be helpful because this thing is just secreting prostaglandins prostaglandins. So we can see why a quick NSAID would resolve his pain. So 30 year old woman with pain in her hips, her upper back as well, and also a few other muscles around her body. She's 30 years old. She also reports headaches and difficulty sleeping. What does she have? What's the medical management of this? The first line medical management, not lifestyle and tenderness in how many areas? So that gives it away. Tenderness in how many areas? It also gives it away because you can see it on the screen. But So this is gonna be fibromyalgia. The first line medical management is amitriptyline. Pregabalin is also FDA approved. So amitriptyline for fibromyalgia. And you always wanna start with lifestyle and aerobic, like we said, lifestyle changes. And 11 out of 18 areas for trigger points, you need to be positive. So if you're palpating them, they have these specific areas with with pain, and if you're palpating at least 11 out of the 18, that's uh, diagnostic for fibromyalgia. Okay, a 55-year-old woman with giant cell arteritis was diagnosed by her cardiologist, which was diagnosed by her cardiologist. She comes in today to ortho to complain about muscle pain in her hips and shoulders, as well as progressive weakness and pain. What does she have? What labs will be increased in this condition? And what is the treatment? So this is polymyalgia rheumatica, not polio, not polymyositis. So polymyalgia rheumatica associated with GCA, we should know. No CK, creatinine kinase, or aldolase will increase in this condition. They may have an elevated ESR CRP, just general inflammatory markers, nothing diagnostic there. And also pain and stiffness predominates. So polymyalgia, algae is pain, so pain in this condition. And also you want to do low dose corticosteroids as the treatment, low dose corticosteroids. And they, they might, if they already have GCA, you need to treat that with high dose corticosteroids. So but if they only have polymyalgia rheumatica, low dose corticosteroids. And remember no CK or aldolase increase. Okay. A 65 year old man on a Torvastatin took some cocaine and they went on a long run. Now he comes to the office because his urine is red and he's concerned. 
what do you think the problem is? What kidney problem is he having? What kidney problem is he having? What is his electrolytes going to look like? Very important. And what test must we always get in this patient? That's a good one. So a few things in the vignette are classic also for this condition. So this is rhabdomyolysis, breakdown of muscle. It's gonna give them a kidney problem of acute tubular necrosis because that myoglobin is gonna be toxic to the kidneys, so acute tubular necrosis. EKG findings, or the EKG is what we must always get, why? Because the hyper-K can lead to arrhythmias and other cardiac malf malfunctions, so we always need to get an EKG in rhabdo. And remember, um, cells are bags of potassium, so we're gonna be releasing tons of potassium in rhabdo. Also, phosphates too. Remember, ATP is inside the cell, so adenosine triphosphate, a lot of phosphates, so hyperphos, hypocalcemia, creatinine kinase, of course, creatinine is in the muscle too, and also red urine is not due to the red blood cells, but it's due to the myoglobin, so the myoglobin, which is the most specific test. So remember that if you get rhabdo, what is the most specific test? That's going to be myoglobin. And IV fluids are needed to be done, as well as calcium gluconate potentially to stabilize the cardiac membranes against that hyper-K, or insulin and glucose to uh, shift the potassium into the cell if you really got a pretty big hyperkalemia. Okay, the patient is having muscle weakness, but not pain in her hips, so we should definitely get this one. Muscle weakness, not pain in her hips and shoulders, those proximal muscles, especially when combing the hair, rising from a chair and showering. She is 40 years old. What does she have? <clears throat> what will the labs show in this patient? Important to know what will the labs show? What will the antibodies be? And what is the definitive diagnostic method? Okay, labs, antibodies, definitive diagnosis in this patient. That's going to be polymyositis. That's going to be polymyositis. And just think about that in comparison to polymyalgia rheumatica. So creatinine kinase and aldolase will be elevated in this patient. Anti-JO and anti-SRP signal recognition protein will be elevated. A biopsy is the definitive diagnosis, and corticosteroids in a high dose will be the treatment. So don't forget those anti-JO and anti-SRP. So how I remember that is polymyositis, so yo and jo. I don't know, that just stuck with me. Yo and jo for polyomyositis and anti-SRP. And remember, we need to do a biopsy for these conditions. Okay, so the next one's a patient with a history of ovarian cancer. They also got a rash on their back in blue color of their upper eyelids. It gets worse in the sun, and there's also a rough appearance of the hands, especially the knuckles. What does she have? What antibodies in labs would you get, or would you see that are positive? And what do we specifically see? What do we specifically use for the skin lesions? So that's a tougher one. What do we use for those skin lesions? So remember the history of ovarian cancer. That's going to be dermatomyositis. So I think 25% of all patients with dermatomyositis also have cancer, potentially ovarian cancer. So that's dermatomyositis. Goutron's papules are those raised, violaceous, scaly knuckle eruptions. So that's what the, malfun that's what the problem with her hands is. <clears throat> they have a shawl sign on their back, which is the rash, and a heliotrope rash on the eyes which is those upper eyelid rash. And also they have anti jo too as well. anti jo myositis So they also have anti jo and the mechanic hands as well. And they also have an anti my 2 which is most specific. So dermatomyositis is my 2 and anti jo And polymyositis is anti jo and anti-SRP. All right. So you also want to do hydroxychloroquine for the skin lesions. And like we said before, remember to check the eyes for hydroxychloroquine. So skin lesions, you can use hydroxychloroquine. Okay, so the last one for this video, then we'll continue along, is going to be lupus. So we must know lupus. What is the soap brain MD mnemonic for all things SLE? So if we know the soap brain MD mnemonic, we know a lot about SLE basically. So S, serositis. So serositis, that could be the serous membranes of the pleura. So you could have pleural problems, 
<laughs> you could have pericardial problems and also the eyes. So serositis of all those serous membranes. And sometimes people can have lupus, um, pericardial effusions or pericarditis. So O, oral ulcers, aphthous ulcers, O. A, arthritis. So they can also have that ulnar deviation seen in RA as well. P, classically photosensitivity and a malar rash. So definitely photosensitive. <clears throat> B, blood disorder. So it's important to know anemia of chronic disease in SLE. And antiphospholipid syndrome as well in SLE. And Raynaud's as well in SLE. So they can have all those things in SLE. Raynaud's, anemia, chronic disease, antiphospholipid syndrome. They'll have renal abnormalities, and this is the most serious and the most harsh prognosis if they have problems with renal. They're going to have a low complement, C3 and C4, with their renal problems. They'll be ANA positive, um, so BRA, I, immunologic problems. This is the important ones to note here. Anti-DSDNA, very specific. Anti-Smith, I believe is the most specific, but no anti-DS, double-stranded DNA anti-Smith antibody, anti-phospholipid antibody, and anti-Rho, which is in neonatal. So no anti-Rho in neonatal lupus and antihistones for drug-induced lupus. So very important to know, they always ask this, anti antihistone antibodies in drug-induced lupus and what are the meds that induce drug-induced lupus? This is always asked. I remember as HIPQ, hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, or perizinamide, and quinidine. So HIPQ, they can also have neurophenomenon, and the most classic of all is the M, macular, uh, rather, malar rash. It's a butterfly rash sparing the nasolabial fold, so kind of over their cheek, but um, spares like basically the bridge of their mouth. They can also have discoid lupus, which is like a circular annular lesion, and they can have chronic cutaneous lupus, which is that annual lesion, discoid lupus. Okay, so we'll stop there, and then we'll continue along with the rest of the MSK um, in the next video.